I will move on to OpenTry. So I think OpenInit is pretty straightforward. It's mostly just about generating this new connection struct and setting it in our state. Sorry, I have a question still about the init. Uh, yeah. So, so why do we need the counterparty here? Uh... Yes, because we need to specify who we're actually trying to talk to. So in the init, so let's on chain on, on Swampy, right? We need the, 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 yeah, the, the yeah. relayer. The relayer is um, so the reason. I think it will make more sense when we look at the try. But the okay. reason is you need it for the try verification. Okay. Because on the try verification, right? We're not only verifying that the person we're talking to is correct. We're also verifying that the person they're trying to talk to is correct. So the init needs to specify that so that we can actually verify it. Does that make sense? Uh, not completely, but hopefully later it will. Yeah. Yes. I will try to highlight it again. If after open try it doesn't make sense, then we can come back to it. Cool. So the first thing that I want to jump into on the open try step is the crossing hellos, because we have a nice chunk of code that we can highlight to specify which situation we're in. So the first thing we do is we just check to see if a previous connection ID actually exists. Um, and the reason why we do that is because we want to know if we're in the crossing hellos case, if we called open in it. So here in this case right here, that's crossing hellos. We called open in it, they called open in it, and now we're doing open try. So we check to see if that, um, so that's crossing hellos. The other case is that we're creating a new connection identifier. But if we're in the crossing hellos case, then an important thing we need to do is make sure that we're continuing this connection handshake how we started it, that we're not just changing things um, in the next step. So we get the existing connection and we verify that all of the parameters the relayer is telling us that we want to do for this connection handshake, that those all match, that none of those values have changed and that we're still doing the same and we're still continuing the same handshake that we begun, that if we're trying to connect to osmosis, we're still trying to connect to osmosis. This hasn't changed to like an Akash chain or something like that. And of course, the connection state also needs to be an init because this was a crossing hellos case. And if all of that is fine, then we can go ahead and use this previous connection ID. And the previous connection ID came in the message from the relayer? Correct. So it has actually one of these arguments, which I believe is the uh, in the open try message. OK. And, and if the relayer doesn't uh, send that uh, previous connection ID, uh, you could still have crossing hellos, but then uh, the result would be two connections open? Um, say that again. So if the relayer, for whatever reason, I don't know, doesn't send this previous connection ID in the message, uh, that would result that you end up with two connections open? Uh, correct. Because in this case, what we're doing, so the relayer, like you said, passes in the previous connection ID. And originally, this was just called connection ID, but it was renamed to previous connection ID, so it would be easier to understand. Um, so basically, if the relayer is doing an open try step, if there was a previous connection ID, they should specify it. If there wasn't a previous connection ID, they shouldn't specify it. And that's what the code checks here, is did the relayer say there was a previous connection ID? If so, then we like check that it exists and we're continuing the handshake. Otherwise, we're generating a new connection because we're on try. And, and this is the connection ID on, in, this, in our example, Bloomore, right? Yes, correct. So now we get into some interesting stuff. And I'm just going to jump around to, um, because I think if we go in order, it'd be a little bit more confusing. So the first thing that we actually want to do is we want to verify that the person they're trying to talk to, 
So in this case, we're Bluemore. Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to verify that Svampe is actually trying to talk to us, that they've found the correct person and that they're not actually looking for someone else. So we do some preliminary work here by getting our latest height. We get our self height, which should be, yeah, the current block height. And we check to see if the uh, consensus height is greater than or equal to this uh, block height, because then that would be an error, right? Because we're process we're still processing the current block, so we haven't actually committed it yet. But we're going to use this consensus height that was provided for validation of ourselves. So when we check to make sure that they're trying to talk to the correct person, we're using this connection height in the proof. So we just want to make do a little quick sanity check there. But the next important thing we do is we do two things. One, we validate that the, the client state they're trying to, they're telling us to prove, the relayer is providing us a client state in this uh, function. They're providing us a client state and they should be providing us a, uh, maybe they aren't providing a connection state, but they're providing a client state that we're gonna use and we're gonna uh, prove that. So we're gonna make sure that in the state of Svampe, they have this They have this client state stored. But the first thing we want to do is just a little sanity check on that client state. So that the card, you can think of that as the card that Svampe is holding. That is the photo of Bloomwater. So when I go back to validate self-client, this is looking at the card that Svampe is holding. And I need to go to O2 client. Cool. So this is, we, this is the function we have here. And what this function is doing at a high level is it's taking the client state that Svampe has stored, and it's checking that all of the parameters that are currently set in there match our information. So this includes like chain ID, this includes um, the revision number, includes the proof specs, just any sort of particular information related to us as a chain. This is also the same information we might set or change when we upgrade a chain, when we need to upgrade client uh, counterparty clients. So the first thing we do is we actually just assert that this is a Tendermint client because this is running on the SDK which is presumably connected to Tendermint. So they should be uh, they should be providing us a client state, which is a Tendermint-like client. Then we want to check to make sure that that client isn't frozen. We want to make sure that the chain ID matches ours. So if uh, we are Bloomore, then we want to make sure that the chain ID they have written on their card says Bloomore. We want to make sure that the revision is correct. We also want to make sure that the uh, that our self height is uh, larger than the uh, latest height of the client, right? Because the like client should always be in the past of our current state. Um, looks like this is a bit of a duplicate check, but that's fine. Um, we want to check that the proof specs are correct because this is how they're going to be proving things. So we want to make sure that's correct. We validate the trust level is within a certain range that we support. We check the unbonding period to make sure it's that the same unbonding period we have, because this is not a controllable parameter. This is something we set as a chain. We check to make sure that the trusting period is less than the unbonding period. That's a requirement of, uh, ICS, of ICS 7, that the trusting period must be less than the unbonding period. And then we check to see that the upgrade path is correct. So when we upgrade our chain, we want to make sure that that counterparty client can also be upgraded as well. So if we change our unbonding period right here, we want to make sure that they have the correct path to actually do all of that proof and make sure that that can actually succeed. So that's verifying the client state. So how does it work? I mean, here it, it kind of expects a Tendermint client. Um, if we have other like clients, getting integrated in, 
Is there a way that they can easily, like more modularly be substituted into this high check or validation? Yeah, so the one I, it's a little bit tough because the, this is a discussion we had a long time ago is, but it kind of comes down to like, can, does the SDK support non-tendermint clients? And the answer is just no at the moment. And it requires a lot of work to make the SDK support non-tendermint clients. But uh, at this level, if we really, really wanted to, then what we could do is we could swap out this function into some sort of interface that whoever's running this code could easily just specify on like app.go or something like that, where mm -hmm. the app.go file provides the function that should be used here. Um, but in general, that's kind of an unnecessary abstraction at the current moment where I don't think anyone's asking for this feature. Right, okay. It also, in order to support um, if we are assuming that it's not a Tendermint client which is running this code, there may need to be other changes as well. This just happens to be the most direct. Cool. Um, and so the next, um, so there we verified the client state, but we also need to verify the consensus state. And we do this just by getting our own, um, by getting our own consensus state. So instead of the, instead of being passed a consensus state, which we, did, we then checked fields like we did with client state, we can just generate the consensus state based on the hype provided because the consensus state is very simple and we already have all of that information stored. It's actually stored in the staking keeper as what you might have seen as historical entries. And um, if you've been around long enough, you would know that at one point it was a problem with historical entries causing issues with the connection handshake because historical entries are actually pruned in the staking keeper. And so because this connection handshake requires us to get a previous version of ourself, so we're getting some at some block height we're getting the consensus information for ourselves. We're getting the root and the validator set. And um, what was happening was relayers were relying on this on-chain consensus state information in order to construct like client updates and things like that. And that was just wrong because over time, this historical info would be pruned. And so then eventually the connection handshake would just fail if enough time passed between the, uh, the connection state that you're trying to prove and this is historical entry pruning. Even worse, um, it was it, it could happen that a chain could launch with the historical entries set to zero, which means that all of the historical entries were pruned, which basically just made connection handshake impossible because it would try to get its self-consensus state at a past height, but we're not storing any self-consensus states with historical entries set to zero. And then so it tries to get that height and it just fails here on line 256. So that's why the his historical entry parameters in staking actually matters. It's giving us a buffer for how much time can pass between when we initialize our connection handshake and when we can do the try step and the act step. So generally, um, it's pretty ad hoc which value you should use for historical entries, but I think something like at least an hour or at least 10 minutes or something would be good so that the relayers have enough time to actually complete this handshake. But I think it's currently set for like a day. Cool. So again, this function is just generating its consensus state. So it's getting the timestamp, the root, and the next validator hash. And it's getting this from the staking keeper. Cool. So now that we validated that the client state that the relayer provided is correct, and we got our expected consensus state, we can actually verify these. So now we're calling these two functions. You should have seen these um, when you did the walkthrough with Aditya, hopefully at the 10 minute like client level. So you should have a general understanding of how it might actually do this proof. But we can kind of think of these as more of a black box, whereas this verify client state function is taking the client state and some proof and a proof height, and it's checking if that proof is correct for that client state. So if this returns true, 
that is indicating to us that the client state the relayer passed in is actually stored on the counterparty for this specific height. So in our example, that means that Bloomore is verifying that Svampe actually has that picture of Bloomore in their hand at a specific moment, maybe five minutes ago. And we do the same thing with the consensus state because we need both pieces of information. We need not just the verification parameters in a self-description of us, but we also need a little bit of a timestamp. So you can kind of think of this as like the ID card and then maybe like the expiration date on that ID card. If I try to use an ID card from 10 years ago, it's going to be expired and no one's going to want to accept it. So this consensus state is giving us a little bit of a recent snapshot in time just so that um, we can be sure that, uh, because you can have two client states representing the same chains, but depending on the consensus states, they could be entirely different chains because a chain is represented by its next validator hash in the root hash, not just what chain ID it's choosing to use. Cool. Um, I can jump into these a little bit. ICS3 specification has all of these verify functions defined at this layer, I think, as a useful abstraction um, because you can get the client from the connection layer. So in this file I'm at in verify.go, this is just in the O3 connection keeper. So this verify.go, it just has a bunch of functions that look almost identical. Verify client state, verify client consensus state, verify connection state, verify channel state. You'll see that in the O4 channel handshake, verify packet commitment, and so forth. Verify packet acknowledgement, it keeps going. But all of the proof functions that we need to use and which are um, interfaces that the client implements, those are called here at the O3 client, O3 connection level. But what we care about right now is just the client state and the client consensus state. And so the general thing we do for each of these functions is we need to actually get the client that we're using to, doing, to do this verification. So we get the light client stored on our chain. And the, uh, this was recently added where we actually check the status of it now. So we make sure that we're not doing any sort of uh, verification or processing with it unless it's actually active because we don't want to be sending packets or allowing acknowledgments to be processed or any of that if the status isn't active. And then finally, we make a callback to this client algorithm to verify the client state at this specific height using um, the client state provided and the proof provided. Is there a way um, to update the client state after the creation? For example, um, there was this issue where Hermes defaulted to not allowing activation of expired clients by governance. Um, is yes, there, yeah. but it's um, it's not trivial. So the only way you can, so what you cannot do is there's two types of parameters in a client state. There is chain specific parameters. So those are parameters decided by a chain. This includes chain ID and bonding period. Those are like the two most obvious ones. Then it includes several parameters, which are custom options, which are parameters set by the initial relayer. What we can do is we can change the chain parameters. We can change the chain ID, we can change the unbonding period, we can change the proof specs, all that good information. What we cannot do is we cannot change the custom options because there's no reasonable way to do that. Because otherwise you're just relying on, there's no way to prove that these should be updated. Okay, so, so the client state params like, um, so this one in particular would not be able to be updated after the client creation. Yeah, exactly. I actually, with that problem in particular, I my I need to think about it some more, but I'm a little bit in uh, favor of just ignoring those fields entirely because I'm not sure I see good reason for why we should allow clients to not be updated by governance since governance could always just do it the hard way. Right. Okay, interesting, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great question. 
And so if we look at the verify client consensus state, it's the exact same process, except now we're verifying the client consensus state and we're passing in the consensus state we got from ourselves and the proof.